So my YouTube channel, and you're going to ask me all the questions. You're correct. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Gareth. So I'm hijacking it now, Pookie. <laughs> so am I correct in saying that you've recently learnt a bit more about yourself? I have recently learned a bit more about myself. So when I was hospitalised with anorexia, then I got a diagnosis of autism. Um, which was incredibly helpful because it meant that my treatment got completely changed, but it was also a bit of a, yeah, mind-blown moment. <laughs> okay, so there's loads there, and I've got like a million questions. But okay. first of all, I think, you know, I'm really interested in diagnoses and, and the power of knowing and labels and how that, what that means to you. So I've got two questions for you to start with. What does that diagnosis mean to you now? And uh, what would it have meant, do you think, if you knew that earlier? Um, so it's complicated. So now it's really helpful. So it's helpful because it meant I was able to get the right treatment. And in terms of kind of getting and staying well, uh, generally, and with the anorexia and stuff, it's been helpful because I now have a much better understanding of what my limits are and why, and I'm a lot more forgiving of myself. Um, so I've completely changed how I manage my life. So it's been helpful in that point of view. Um, but on the other hand, um, yeah, I have this issue around being really high functioning and a lot of my experience in the past having worked with special schools with, you know, very severe autistic children and things um, and kind of thinking, I don't really feel like I have the rights to that label. I don't feel like I can own it. So I, I'm struggling a bit in terms of identifying. With it. Yeah. yeah. And I suppose for me, that probably highlights the fact that, you know, everybody's an individual. Yeah. And actually, simply the, the, the diagnosis, you know, means a lot more to different people depending upon who you are and where you are. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, absolutely. And it's not like, I guess some people don't, you know, you wouldn't want a certain label and, and, and some kinds of labels, certainly some of the ones I've had to do with my mental health have sometimes mm -hmm. got sort of stigma or shame or, you know, different things attached to them. And there's nothing like that with it. You know, mm -hmm. I'd be perfectly happy to be out and proud about being autistic, except that I just, I, I don't know. I, I don't feel like I, I don't, I don't know. It's a bit hard to own it because I just feel like I don't struggle enough compared to so many people so. and, and I think that's really interesting this notion of struggle sort of legitimizes yeah. a diagnosis and again <laughs> I think thinking back to what might it have meant earlier I think that's something perhaps that young people find really hard you know yeah. when, when they're say teenagers or certainly when we think about the diagnostic criteria for autistic girls and that you know the the misrepresentation of that group yeah. really in, in our world well you know what do you think it might have meant differently if you knew this at 11 for example I think it probably would have meant I would have been a lot more forgiving of myself and also just simple things like I did find, you know, school was a place that I loved and it was a real kind of, you know, safe space for me. But there were lots of things that I found really difficult. I mean, I spent basically all of my lunch times and break times hiding um, and things like the lunch hall were always hugely overly complicated for me. So I didn't really go into the lunch hall in my secondary school for basically the whole of my secondary school career. Um, and, and, you know, things like that, I think understanding it, yeah, it would have helped and I would have perhaps been a bit more forgiving and wouldn't have kept on trying to, I was constantly trying to force, you know, I was a square peg trying to go into a round mm -hmm. hole um, and particularly around sort of social stuff. And again, you feel like you, you want to want to do things, but it doesn't mean you ever enjoy them. And yeah, I, even throughout my adult life, I think I've always kind of had this idea that if I get better, then suddenly I'll be the person who wants to have like dinner parties and do all this kind of thing and I'll suddenly become really sociable and I, yeah coming to a realization that that's never going to be my thing it's actually quite freeing <laughs> yeah yeah sure and, and I suppose um you talked there about how the diagnosis meant your treatment was different um, yeah. what, what's that mean so when I was um inpatient with anorexia then the ward that I was on was an eating disorders unit and they did basically all their treatment as group therapy, which for me was really, I mean, it was actively harmful rather mm. than anything else. And other things like I had, um, so, so I stopped having to do the group therapy, which is great. Everything that then became completely individualized, which made a big difference. But the other thing was that lots of my behaviors around food were much more around like um, autistic type behaviors and traits. Um, rather than being traditionally anorexic. So when people were trying to help me overcome, you know, fears about getting fat and calories and that kind of thing, it was nothing to do with any of that. A lot of it would just be really quite irrational fears um, and, yeah, just very, very rigid choice structure. So 
I remember, for example, being uh, in, in a really difficult place at one point when I wasn't eating any solid food and I was living entirely off this, this liquid supplement, but I would only have one flavor of it. And at this point, it was before the diagnosis and the doctors wouldn't understand why it had to be that flavor. And, I, and, and it caused a really, really big issue. And I was absolutely adamant and refused everything and had to be restrained and all this sort of thing. Once I'd had that diagnosis and they just understood, look, okay, we don't necessarily, you know, it doesn't make sense to us, but it's got to be that one and it causes huge distress. Otherwise, then we just cracked on and, and did the one flavor and were able to just stop worrying so much about the little things and just yeah. accept them, really. So this sort of brings out some challenging questions for me. And I suppose, you know, I, I always want to say if you feel they're too challenging or you don't want to answer something, yeah. don't answer it. Okay, so um, you're talking there about the sort of the comorbidity of need and the complexity of those interactions within things. Do you think um, actually the diagnosis was more important to the people treating you or should they have been able to understand the need for um, that personalised um, approach for you irrespective of a diagnosis? No, I think the diagnosis was really helpful actually because the thing with um, anorexia is it does, you, you kind of, you do quite a lot of unreasonable things and you do become quite manipulative mm -hmm. and you, there are some strange behaviours and difficulties that go with it. Mm -hmm. And you would often see some of these quite challenging behaviours from people um, and, and, and one of the jobs of the, of the clinician, of the doctors, of the nursing team is to actively challenge those things. Mm -hmm. But for me, that wasn't helpful. That challenge wasn't helpful. It was actively making things worse. Yeah. Whereas if I'd been, um, yeah, more traditionally anorexic rather than the sort of, yeah, atypical autistic kind of line, um, then that, that challenge would have been helpful. Um, but yeah, for me, it was it was it was yeah. actively helpful. So yeah, I think it was important for them, and and it, yeah, it gave them permission to revise their treatment. I mean, it meant we were all then slightly a bit like ah, because this is quite a young field, yeah, and yeah. people don't really know how to deal with it. And I suppose again, I think that's an important word, uh, giving people permission. So it's 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 almost like it's allowing a certain course, yeah. isn't it? And I'm wondering whether actually some schools think like that yeah. when there's a label, a diagnostic criteria, or some information comes out that they feel they uh, legitimised an approach that they wouldn't otherwise. And I suppose yeah. I'm thinking, why do you need that to do that? If it's right for the yeah. person, why don't you just do it? I guess, <laughs> yeah, I guess so. I, yeah, no, it's true. Although I think, I don't know, in a way, I, I think it, it, it does help it can help to understand and also just some of the, the tricky things day to day so it really it sounds like a really silly example but it was a big deal for me the room where I had therapy when I was inpatient had this clock that was really loud mm. in it and I literally like I, I really struggle with 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 sort of sensory overload uh, and this clock I remember in particular whatever was going on in that session mm. I couldn't focus in on anything yeah. um, because of this clock and, and it really 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 bothered me and as soon you know and I've said so many times I want to get rid of the clock and literally after I had the diagnosis then, then they kind of like oh yes that's fine it's sensory overload We'll get rid of the clock. Mm -hmm. And actually, then I was able to focus in on the therapy. And before that, they felt like I wasn't engaging. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't. It's just that my therapist was asking me really hard questions. And all I could hear was this blooming clock. Do you know what I mean? And, 100%. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think that happens in schools a lot with things like projectors and yeah. things like that, where perhaps a, a young person who has uh, sensory overload or some uh, yeah. heightened uh, needs in those areas is sat under the projector. It's buzzing away yeah. all the time. Be, and you literally can't. And that's yeah. it. And I think... I think I think they thought I was making excuses up until that yeah. point. I think literally, you know, that they're like, look, just, it, it's a clock, get over it. Yeah. But then once you're like, I'm autistic and it's a clock, they're like, oh, you're autistic and it's a clock, the yeah. clock can go. <laughs> so I suppose thinking about who might watch this or who might yeah. understand this story or uh, how it might improve other people's experiences, you know, how, how do you think the people in those clinical settings actually might uh, go about things differently? I think... I think one of, one of the things is actually just bearing in mind that autism is a possibility because um, for me it was something that was suggested really late but when my psychologist and psychiatrist they basically were like how do you not already have a diagnosis because they thought I was they, they thought it was pretty obvious um, but I think it just hadn't been considered before that and I think it often does get masked by eating disorder yeah, yeah, yeah. so we think that there is a quite a high degree of comorbidity mm -hmm. and the other thing is that when your brain is starved like anorexic thinking and autistic thinking often there's quite a lot of similarities mm -hmm. there so I think people who are treating for eating disorders having an understanding of autism anyway that will help them to understand some of the really rigid mm -hmm. thinking of their their underweight patients um, but yeah I think being kind of open-minded really and also just perhaps yeah, maybe seeking a diagnosis where there is the possibility of one, not kind of closing it off. Because I think so, we can get so hung up on, you know, I think my treatment team at, at, at the time, 
were so worried about you know the physical danger I was in because I was so underweight that they perhaps not really thinking about the bigger picture but actually for me I wasn't able to get better and get out of that physical danger zone until we revised the treatment quite radically I mean I was just getting iller and iller so you yeah. know so, again thinking more about so the work I've been involved with I suppose my lack of uh, knowledge in this area really um, you know, I suppose you go to hospital, you are in a medical process there, you are being treated to be better. Yeah. Uh, and I suppose, you know, people um, think it's almost like you break your leg and then you go in and you're fixed as a result. <laughs> well, you can't be fixed in a way, can you? So what, what you know, do, do you think there's conflict within the understanding of that? Um, yeah, and that's something I'm still kind of very much sort of coming to terms with really, mm. is understanding because obviously it was one thing when I had that diagnosis and I was very ill and I just had so much to manage every day anyway. But now it's about what well, and what does this look like when I'm well? Because mm. for me, you know, well and managing day to day and being healthy it doesn't mean the autism is going to go away. So mm. I have to learn to manage that and know what that looks like and know how I own that. And if that's something I share and I, yeah, that I don't really know the answer to any of those. Yeah. And, and so um, I suppose I often think of things like this in terms of quite crudely in terms of, sort of risk and resilience factors and, yeah. and what builds in the resilience to help mitigate or support those, those yeah. areas of risk. And what would you say personally are your biggest resilience factors? I think the people around me. So everyone around me has been incredibly um, helpful and kind. And I have generally found that if I'm a bit more open about that you know the, the autism and the things that I find difficult people are really forgiving so mm. things like as you know I work at a lot of conferences and I love you know I love the work that I do mm. but it is it does really take its toll on me um, and actually explaining to people when I'm working with them actually you know I might not want to have lunch with all your delegates so I might need a room somewhere mm. and then providing that space um, and time um, can make a big difference so yeah being able to be open and honest about it and people having a bit of an understanding is helpful mm. Um, I think the other thing for me, as you know, I've gone on about it, climbing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, yeah. yeah, for me, the, the climbing wall is somewhere I can go and however, you know, whatever state of kind of uh, overwhelm I'm in and, and I can get very, very anxious, um, but I go to the wall and it's literally like you hit this big reset button and then I'm, I'm ready to go again. I can do people again after that. <laughs> and I think, you know, again, I, I sort of term it in school sometimes, like these positive care routines, things that you yeah. do all the time that feed into a yeah. really important sort of uh, sort of baseline yeah. it, to help reset in a way and I think again yeah. for some of our learners it might be um, pets and animals yeah. that's important for some people it yeah. is sport um, and I think what we found recently when we we're doing some work with some of our autistic girls is that uh, a lot of the activities they were engaged in were wholly reliant on an adult um, yeah. a parent or carer taking them to the activity okay. and really investing in that and, and when they didn't have that opportunity or it wasn't possible within the family group, actually it, it limited their opportunities to engage in different yeah. things. So I'm thinking, and I, and I don't really know the answer to this, that actually lots of properly supported community activities and sport with understanding yeah. is really important to give you that opportunity to find that thing, the yeah, grounding point or, or yeah. whatever, you know. Yeah being, able to, yeah, being able to find the thing that, that works for you so you don't, yeah that's it for me I kind of stumbled upon it almost by by chance but mm. but but by the same token as you say it, lots of different things can be helpful so again you know for me and my dog actually getting up and getting out with my dog every day is really important routine yeah. having a routine every day and knowing so for me again that the holidays are often a time when I really struggle and now I understand why that is you know I'm someone who needs and thrives on routine and yeah. the school holidays come along and suddenly my kids haven't got to be up and out every day yeah. and everything goes to pot actually now we have an understanding in our house yeah. that that routine kind of needs to yeah. stay um, and again my family have been great about that and, yeah. and that does really help and actually I think it's good for all of us yeah yeah absolutely I, I, I sometimes think that the kind of accommodations that you make to kind of manage autism mm. they're actually a lot of those accommodations are good for everybody yeah, in, yeah. in many ways yeah. you know it's a bit like you were saying actually yeah. you find after these things having a bit of time out on your own so I'm, I'm literally yeah. sometimes a bit like after all this peopling I want to be in a darkened room on my own yeah, but yeah. I think actually to some extent that's 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 mm. normal isn't it absolutely and I, I think you know understanding the importance of routines I think is essential you know and yeah. it, again it is different for everybody isn't it you know yeah. people can actually uh, manage and, and uh, function really well with quite unstructured routines but in effect that is their routine yes. you know yeah. and I think we, we underestimate sometimes by thinking a routine is about constant fixed state yeah as opposed to this idea of the flow between them and, uh, yeah, and understanding absolutely. that which is fascinating definitely one of the things that I find I found hard about diagnosis is I find sometimes when I tell people who I've known for a long time 
and they can be quite dismissive of it and go, well, that's obviously wrong because they know me and they've known me for a long time and they'll say, but you're not like this and you're not like this because people have this really, you know, that A, they have a view of what autism's like, but B, they have a view of what I'm like because of how I present mm -hmm. myself to the world. So, and I think that's something people don't necessarily understand is how hard work it is just doing normal. Like yeah, yeah. When, when, you know, the whole world is this massive kind of calculation the whole time and I'm always kind of, you know, 10 steps ahead in a conversation trying to understand what I'm meant to be doing and how and, and what this body language means and stuff. And I'm more aware of the fact I'm doing that now. But it is really tiring. And I think, yeah, people don't get that actually that's complicated for me because I've worked really hard all my life for it to not look... Com Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, yeah, And I think a key thing there is where you're saying what I'm meant to be doing. It's almost like, a, you know, that there's a perception or yeah. there's an expectation perhaps even that that individuals have to uh, play a part, yeah. uh, you know, and, and somebody else is imposing the role on them, saying this yeah. is the role you've got to play. Uh, and actually, I think talking about your interactions with people you've known a long time, you know, that, that to me is also about education and knowledge, you know. And, yeah. uh, a lot of people who um, are uh, very experienced and perhaps have a, 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 you know, perhaps a high academic profile or whatever, you know, don't necessarily understand what autism means, yeah. you know, and I think people still learn through um, misconception a lot of the time. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and the other sadness is obviously I haven't suddenly become a mathematical genius, yeah. which is yeah. disappointing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, it's fantastic, and I learned so much. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thanks for hijacking my channel. It's all right. <laughs>